All right, friends, I want to welcome you to today's very special Rethink series. This is the next teaching in our Rethink series. My name is Jerry Robinson from TrueRichesRadio.com. Great to have you here today. Now, uh, as you well know, we have been talking about several different topics over the last uh, several or a few months in this Rethink series where we've been talking about many things. We began with Thomas Jefferson. We took a look at the man, Thomas Jefferson, and rethought uh, what his propositions were and why they might be or may not be important to a Christ follower. We also talked about rebellion and talked about the importance of, of understanding rebellion. We've also talked about uh, Rome. In fact, we talked about Rome uh, just last time we got together. We wanted to rethink Rome, and we talked about America. Is America a type of a new uh, Rome? So we talked about that as well. Uh, you can find those teachings, by the way, truerichesradio.com forward slash Rome if you missed that teaching. You can find the rebellion teaching uh, similarly, truerichesradio.com forward slash rebellion. But today, we're going to be moving into the topic of peace, specifically uh, peace and talking about rethinking peace. This, of course, is a very important topic uh, uh, today. We do want to cover quite a bit in today's session, so we're going to move right in to that topic. And um, you know, before we really kind of dive into it, we want to remember that this time of year is the time when many people are talking about peace. Uh, the Prince of Peace is going to be talked about in, in uh, sermons all across the country here in the United States, and I'm sure in many other parts of the world. There'll be sermons on the Prince of Peace. There'll be sermons on what peace means. There'll be sermons on the need for peace. And we want to contribute to this teaching on peace by providing our own teaching on peace. But instead, we really want to rethink uh, the idea of peace that is promoted here in the United States, and even quite frankly promoted by many, not all, but many American churches. And so we want to rethink. That's the purpose of this series, is to rethink topics that perhaps we think we already know. Before we begin, I want to ask the Lord to bless this time and to seal the message into your hearts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you use my voice, that you use my words, that you use my lips to speak to your people the message that you want them to hear. Lord, help me to say the things that need to be said and help me to uh, do exactly what you've told me to do. Father, also help the hearer to receive in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's begin by talking about peace itself. The word peace occurs many times, of course, as you might imagine, in the New Testament. It occurs, you know, nearly a hundred times. In fact, uh, the word peace in the Old Testament is a very popular Hebrew word called shalom. And many people know the word shalom. It's still even used today in, in uh, modern Hebrew. But the idea of shalom being peace or rest. Well, in the Greek, of course, the word is not shalom for peace. It is another word, irene. Almost sounds like irony, but irene. And this word uh, is a word that means, that refers to one's welfare. It refers to a, a state of quietness. It refers to a state of being undisturbed. Uh, and quite frankly, just wholeness, peace, rest. This is the idea that is expressed about by peace in the New Testament. And we see it, again, in many different places. We can think certainly that we, we know about it when it comes to uh, national peace. All of us are familiar with the idea of a state of national tranquility. Well, that's certainly one aspect of the word peace that's used in the New Testament. So we would certainly think about the exemption of rage and havoc of war, this would be something that would be called peace, right? A state of national tranquility, where it's kind of a corporate peace. Um, and by the way, uh, I spent some time looking at the uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon and found several different uh, interesting uh, points about the peace 
that is used in the New Testament. Another type of peace, of course, refers to the peace between individuals, uh, the idea of harmony, the idea of concord, where good order prevails. So this is the idea of peace, not just within a nation, not within you know, national tranquility or corporate or collective peace, but specifically uh, peace between you know, individuals, peace between uh, two people. So we see that a lot. We see that the peace that, is, uh, that exists between individuals in the New Testament is one characterized by a mild and friendly spirit. We're told to promote concord. We're, we're told to promote harmony or peace. Uh, by the New Testament, by the uh, in the epistles of the New Testament, and even by Christ Himself, and as we well know, uh, peace is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Uh, fruits of the Spirit. We know love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So, peace, of course, an integral part of what Christ has called us to. So, we are called to be peacemakers. That's exactly what Christ calls his disciples to be. He comes and preaches peace, and he calls for peace between individuals. In fact, when we when we look in the Bible, uh, we also see a reference to God, our God, uh, of being a God of peace. Our God is a God of peace. We read about that in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20, but in also many other places as well. We can also think, too, in terms of the fact that many of the epistles written by the uh, apostles begin with grace and peace to you from our Lord uh, Jesus Christ and from God the Father. So we do have this idea of grace and peace being multiplied to you at the very beginning of the epistles. We see it in Paul's epistles. We see it in the Apostle John's epistles. We see it in the writings of, uh, you know, of Peter. Peter uses the same phrase, grace and peace to you. Um, so certainly we see peace is an integral part. It's the fruit of the, it's part of the fruit of the spirit. It's what we're called to do to be peacemakers. Uh, we are called to be walking in peace, but today what I'd like to do is I'd like to hone in on three aspects of peace. First, the prince of peace. We certainly serve a prince of peace. So we want to talk about the prince of peace. We also want to talk about the way of peace, because that is the way that we are called to. And then thirdly, we want to talk about the gospel of peace, because that is what our feet are shod with. And that, according to uh, Paul in the, uh, in the writing about the spiritual armor, but specifically we are called to, a, to share a gospel of peace. That is exactly what Jesus Christ uh, brought whenever he came. So let's begin by talking about the Prince of Peace. And what I want to do is I'm going to open up uh, our Bible today, and I'm going to use Bible Hub. And I'm going to take us to Isaiah chapter 9. So let's open up our Bibles and go to Isaiah chapter 9. And I'm going to open up Bible Hub here as well so we can read along together. So let's go ahead and go to Isaiah chapter 9, and we'll go uh, from verses 2 through 7. So let's go ahead and get that opened up here really simply. On I'm going to BibleHub.com if you want to follow along there, or you can just open up your Bible and follow along together. It's nice to read the Bible together, isn't it? All around the world, we have people from all over the place this morning. I want to welcome all of you for being here. Uh, it's great to have you. So I'm going to open up the uh, New American Standard. This is actually nice because it has the, as you well know, the Strong's Concordance behind it. So as we click, if we want to click on the words to go deeper, we can find out what they are in the in the Greek, and do nice studies on them. So let's zoom in here a little, and now let's read uh, ch uh, Isaiah chapter nine verses two through seven. Now this, of course, is referring to. You can even see the header here: birth and reign of the Prince of Peace. Let's read. Uh, beginning in verse 2. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with the gladness of harvest, 
as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulder, the rod of their oppressor, as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning, fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So clearly as we we take a look at this particular passage that we're looking at here in Isaiah chapter 9, we see the reference to the Prince of Peace. We see that reference to the Prince of Peace that we've been talking about. We also see that He's coming as a child to be born to us, a son that's going to be given to us, and that there's going to be no end to the increase of His government and to the increase of peace in His government. Okay, And then we also notice here something in verse 5, and I think this is very important, something that we're missing, I think, when it comes to peace and what we're really rethinking today when it comes to peace is notice verse 5 again. It says, For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and the cloak rolled in blood will be for burning, fuel for the fire. So in other words, we have the introduction here of the idea of an end to battle, an end to war. The boot, Every boot of the booted warrior in the battle and the cloak rolled in blood will be for burning and fuel for the fire. In other words, there's no need for these anymore. Why? Well, it tells you because the Prince of Peace has come. A child is going to be born to us. A son is going to be given to us. And when he comes, there will be no end to the increase of his government and to his peace. Now, one of the things that we've talked about for many, many years is the importance of understanding that Christ does have a government, that he has a kingdom. And one of the things that we've taught for a long time is that we believe that when we don't acknowledge that God has a kingdom, when we don't acknowledge that He does have a government, then we are ripe for deception because then we will fall prey to the governments of this world, which are not His governments. Right? They, the Bible tells us in Revelation the day that they become His. Right now, they are opposed to God. The governments are largely opposed to God, even though He uses the leaders, even though he uses the rulers and he guides them, they are still operating opposed to his kingdom because they don't pursue what he has called them to pursue, namely peace, right? Namely love and joy and all of the fruits of the spirit, which we do not see displayed by the governments of this world. They are not the governments of our God. These are the governments of man. This is the kingdom of man versus the kingdom of God. But it's important to note that there is a versus, that there is a kingdom of man we all know about, but then there's also a kingdom of God, which is something very different. And those two are in opposition, of course, uh, mainly because man is opposed to God and his kingdoms are opposed to God. But here we see that when the child is born to us and the son is given to us, and this, is, this of course, is referring to Jesus the Christ, that he will have a government, and that government will be reigned over by him, the Prince of Peace, right? And we we see a need for no more of the battle, the the boot of the warrior being uh, tossed as fuel for the fire. It's strange that at Christmas time we will hear this verse: "For a child will be born to us, and a son will be given to us." It's almost on every Christmas card that you receive, or it's a very common phrase. But the context for it tells us that it's also going to mean the end of war. The end of war. The end of war is not later. The end of war is now. The end of strife is not later. 
The end of strife is now. Jesus is not bringing an end to the war later. He brought an end to the war when he came. We are not going to be freed from our enemies later. We have been freed from our enemies now by Christ's sacrifice. There is no more war for us to conduct because the Prince of Peace has come. There is no more battle for us to engage in because we no longer have to deal with our enemies. Our enemies have been vanquished by God. The Prince of Peace has a government. Now, let's, let's continue on because we could stay here for a little bit and, and, and linger, but I want to continue on because we have a lot more to cover uh, in, this, in this session. So let's just remember that in Isaiah chapter 9, it says, of the increase of his government, Jesus' government, and peace, there will be no end. There will be no end. And in, it's going to increase. It's going to become more peaceful and the government is going to become, it's going to increase. Now, you may look around the world, and you may say, well, there's war everywhere. What does it mean that Jesus came? It must mean that later he's going to bring peace, because he certainly didn't bring, bring peace when he came, did he? And if we say that he didn't bring peace when he came, then we misunderstand the Gospels, because that's what the Gospels are telling us. That's what the epistles are revealing to us. That's what the apostles are grappling with, is they're saying, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Jerusalem now as Jesus is getting ready to go back up to heaven? And Jesus is like, look, I've already told you all the answers. I've already given you everything that you need. But I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you to remind you of these things, and that Holy Spirit will empower you and give you the Answers to the questions you're asking. So uh, let's continue on and think about another verse, uh, John 14, 27. Jesus says, peace I leave with you. He's not going to send it to us later. He's not going to bring it whenever he comes to reign upon the earth, as the Bible says in Revelation. Instead, he says, peace I leave with you, as, if, as in now. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Now the world has a peace. And the world has a peace that is interrupted constantly by war. War is constantly uh, uh, disrupting the world's form of peace. But war doesn't interrupt the peace that God brings, that the Prince of Peace brought uh, to the earth. It tells us that the increase of his government and peace will have no end. It is growing now. It has been growing since he was here. There is a gospel of peace we're going to talk about. There is a way of peace that he has called us to walk in. And that, in fact, brings us to the next segment of the teaching, is that we want to talk about the way of peace. We already know that there is a prince of peace who came and has a government. But let's talk about the way of peace of this Prince of Peace that has brought this government. And we can read about this in the prophecy of Zacharias, who is the father of John the Baptist and the high priest of Israel. Now remember, Zacharias is the father of John the Baptist, and according to Jesus, John the Baptist was the greatest man who ever lived prior to Jesus' coming. Right, the, the greatest man who ever lived, according to Jesus. There's never been one greater who was born on the earth, according to Jesus, than John the Baptist. Well, here is his daddy. His daddy is going to prophesy. And what we'll do is we'll go to Luke chapter 1. This is so powerful. Uh, you've probably read this many times before, but let's read it again today with this in mind. We're going to go to Luke chapter 1. Of course, Luke chapter 1 tells the story of John the Baptist. Uh, birth being foretold. We also read about the angel coming to Zacharias. And then we read about Jesus's birth being foretold by the angel Gabriel. Mary visits Elizabeth. Elizabeth uh, is filled with the Holy Spirit and, and prophesies that Jesus is, is her Lord. That's the womb of Mary. Then we see Mary pray to God, and it's a, it's a beautiful uh, prayer. And then we see John being born, John circumcised, but then toward the very bottom of Luke, it's a pretty long chapter, 
at the very bottom of Luke, we read Zacharias's prophecy. We read Zacharias's prophecy. And let's read that together because the Holy Spirit is going to fill Zacharias before it fills Peter, but before it fills the apostles on the day of Pentecost. Um, he, it's going to fill Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, the father of the greatest man who ever lived prior to Jesus Christ and the sons of the kingdom. And the prophecy that Zacharias receives is this. Let's read what it says together. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David his servant, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy towards our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father. Now, I'm going to go ahead and read the whole thing, and then we're going to go back and we're going to talk about a few things because I'm talking about many different concepts here, but I'm going to come back and we're going to look at them together. Let's continue. To grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, talking now to John the Baptist, he's, who has just been circumcised, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways. What is his way? What way is he going? We'll, we'll, can, we'll keep reading. To give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of, his sin, of their sins. Remember, when John the Baptist sees Jesus, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin from the world. John pointed to the salvation. He pointed to the Lamb of God and pointed out, that it meant a redemption from sins and a forgiveness of sins. John knows this. John is given this. John is a special prophet in the Old Testament, the most special. And he is the one who prepares the way for this Prince of Peace. Now it says, Because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us, to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace into the way of peace. So where is he taking the Jews? He is taking them into a way of peace. What is the purpose of this? It's salvation from our enemies and from the hand of those who hate us. Okay, so let's think for a moment about what the, what the Old Testament is filled with. When we think about the Old Testament, what do we think about? If, if you grew up listening to Bible stories of the Old Testament like I did, then, you know, as a child, you'll remember many of the different stories. You remember the story of the Battle of Jericho. You'll remember the story of uh, Samson, uh, you know, fighting with the uh, Philistines. You'll remember uh, the story of David and, and Joshua, you know, fighting. Uh, and there's a lot of bloodshed in the Old Testament, and it makes many people uncomfortable. We've talked about the violent verses of the Old Testament many, many, many times. But if you look at the Old Testament, there really are two different people, and there's really only two different people in the Old Testament. There is the Jew, uh, the people of God, and then there is the Gentile, who is not the Jew, and therefore he is the enemy of God. You have the Jew, who is God's, who, who are God's people, the Jews who are God's people, and the Gentiles, who are without God. There's two different kinds of people in the Old Testament and they are warring at each other. Now, this is important. If you are not of Jewish descent, if you are you know, of Gentile descent like I am, if I do a study of my own lineage, I see we go back to England and Ireland and even Scotland, and I see that it's mainly kind of an Anglo kind of background for me. You may have a different kind of background, but, we, but, if, you don't, but if you're not Jewish, then you have to understand that your ancestors were Gentiles, and they were separate from God, right? And so as a Gentile, you and your ancestors were at war with the Jew. 
So when David picked up his sling and he shot uh, Goliath, he was shooting at you and your ancestors. Okay? Whenever Joshua was storming across the land and he was, you know, taking city after city, when he was sticking the sword into someone, he was sticking that sword into you as a Gentile. You were the enemy. He was sticking that sword into you. He was burning down your city. He was burning down your house. He was bringing, he was visiting war upon your city, upon your people, upon your village. The Gentile and the Jew were at war. God said, don't even eat with them. Stay away from the Gentile. There was a separation in the Old Testament. If we've read the Old Testament, we know this. If we've read the Old Testament, we know that if we weren't the Jews, the Jews might be coming after us if we live in this certain area. Or we might be going after the Jews. There was war between the two men. The Jews, uh, for the most part, weren't picking up the sword and going and killing each other. For the most part, they were going and killing and warring with Gentiles. Those are the stories, the beloved stories that we read in the Bible uh, and tell our children. When David was killing Goliath, when he was put his sling towards Goliath, he was shooting at the Gentile, and he was doing right. If you had been the Gentile at that time, it would have been you. He would have hit you. Or you're someone in your family. The Jews and the Gentiles were at war in the Old Testament. What is the whole Old Testament filled with? Prayers. Save us from our enemies. What does David want? Save us from our enemies. What does Solomon want? Save us from our enemies. What, does, what do all of the people talk about? Save us from our enemies. Right. This is what they want. What does Moses want? To save us from our enemies. What does Joshua want? Save us from our enemy. enemies. Who are the enemy? The Gentile. Who are without God. Who are without Christ. Who are outside the commonwealth of Israel. Who are not party to the promise. Who are not party to the covenants. Who are without God. In the world. Who are without hope. They're the enemy. The Jews are God's people. They have God's uh, presence. They have the covenants of promise. The Gentile is a part. He is the enemy. The Jews are killing Gentiles. The Gentiles are killing Jews. That's the Old Testament. That is the Old Testament. Lots of killing. Who? Jews killing Gentiles. Gentiles killing Jews. Who's the enemy in the Old Testament? The Gentile. So notice what Zacharias is prophesying. He's not saying these words out of his own mouth. He's saying these words inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He has visited us. How? Through Jesus Christ. God is with us. Emmanuel. And accomplished redemption for His people. Redemption. The redemption is here. Jesus Christ is here. And notice what it says. And has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David his servant. Did God promise a government that would last forever? Yes, he did. What is a horn? What is a horn of salvation? Look at this. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, not the Gentile. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant. So what is a horn? Well, when we click on the word horn, we'll find out that it's keros in, in the Greek. It's keros. Now, I, I started looking at this word a while back, and I started thinking, this is interesting, because I've done a lot of research in the book of Revelation and Daniel, where we read about horns all the time. This is the only time the word horn appears in the New Testament outside of Revelation. And in Revelation, they're often referring to governments. So what we see is that Zacharias is rightly understanding that God has raised up a government of salvation, a horn of salvation. Remember, the horns represent power or kings or kingdoms in the, New Te in, uh, uh, in the uh, book of Revelation. Also, they mean uh, kingdoms uh, in the book of uh, Daniel. 
But here we have this horn out, out of place. It's not in Revelation. It's not in Daniel. It's just the only other horn that's in the New Testament aside from Revelation. And it's a horn of salvation for us. This is our horn. This is our horn. Wh whose horn? Those of the house of David. Now remember, this is Zacharias, and I'm still a Gentile, and we're still learning what's happening here. So even though as a Gentile I'm going to be accepted into this, we don't know all of this right now. Let's just continue to read what it says and not know that yet until we see it revealed. It says, and he has raised up a horn of salvation, a government of salvation, a kingdom of salvation, a horn of salvation. Is that horn going to get smaller? No, it's going to get bigger. How do we know? Because of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. So the horn of salvation is going to go larger and larger. It's going to get bigger. He has raised up a horn of salvation for who? For us. Who is us? The Jews in the house of David, his servant, which he has promised. He spoke by the mouth of the holy prophets of old. Now notice what the salvation is from. Salvation from our enemies. What is salvation to the Jew? It is salvation from their enemies. And from the hand of all who hate us. Salvation from, let me highlight this word here, from, salvation from what? Salvation from our enemies. Salvation from what? Salvation from the hand of all who hate us. Who is going to provide this salvation? God. How? Through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. So remember, the salvation is connected to what? Our enemies. Salvation is connected what to what? The hand of those who hate us. Now remember, when Jesus comes along and talks about salvation, He has something to say about our enemies. To the Jew. He, he looks at the Jew and has something to say to them about their enemy. Does He not? Does Jesus have the right answer for how the enemy should be dealt with? Yes, He does. Does Jesus have something to say about the enemy when He comes? Yes, He does. Does Jesus have something to say about those who hate us when He comes? Yes, He does. And He brings salvation from what? From those who are enemies and those who hate us. Does Jesus tell us how to handle those who hate us? Yes, He does. And there's salvation in that answer. Does He tell us how to handle our enemies when the Prince of Peace comes? Does He mention enemies and have anything to say about them? Yes, He does. And in that answer is your salvation. Now, as we go on, we see that the salvation is from our enemies. Who are the enemy? The Gentile. And from the hand of all those who hate us. Who's that? The Gentile. There's two men in the Old Testament. There's a Jew and there's a Gentile. The Gentile is cut off from the promises of God. The Jew has the promises of God. The Jew uh, is killing the Gentile. The Gentile is killing the Jew. If you were alive back then, and you were a Gentile, you would be apart from the promises of God, and the Jew would have aimed their sword at you, rightfully. Rightfully. So as we continue on, uh, we also see down here in verse 79 that again we see this idea of the light shining into the darkness, those who sit in darkness. And what is, what is this light going to lead the Jews to? Remember, the Jews up until this point have been taking their swords and taking land and killing the Gentile who is their enemy and who hates them. And now he sees, as he's prophesying, Zacharias is with the Holy Spirit filling him, says, this light is going to come into our darkness and it's going to guide our feet into the way of peace. Why? Because they're following the Prince of Peace. Who does what? Who is saving them from their enemies. And does what? Saves them from the hand of those who hate them. Isn't that really all the Jews were ever asking for in the Old Testament? Isn't that the cry of the psalmist? Isn't it the cry of the psalmist to deliver them from their enemies? 
Isn't this what we see in the Old Testament? Lots of enemies coming against Israel and Israel fighting its enemies with swords. There's two men in the Old Testament, a Gentile and a Jew. Very reminiscent of, the, of Abel and Cain from the very beginning, or Ishmael and Isaac. As we go forward, we see the two sons. We see two different. We see two different men. One has the promise. One has the covenants. The other is apart from God. It's, it's outside of God. And the Gentile was the enemy of the Jew. But now, when Jesus comes, the Prince of Peace comes, He's bringing redemption for His people. How? By saving them from their enemies and saving them from the hand of those who hate them. That's what Jesus did. Jesus saved the Jew from the Gentile enemy. He saves them from the hand of the Gentile who hated them. Now, if you're listening to this right now and you're saying, now wait a minute, how did he do that? Well, you're asking the same question that the apostles did whenever they were watching him leave. They were thinking, now wait a minute, Lord, when are you going? Remember Acts chapter 1, he says, Lord, are you about to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Right? Now that you've done all this stuff, I mean, you're getting ready to do that kingdom thing, right? And Jesus is like, you just, you need the Holy Spirit. I've said a lot of things to you. I'm paraphrasing here, of course, what Jesus said, but, but Jesus had told them the answer. He had already told them how to handle their enemies. He had already told them how to handle those who hate them. He was speaking to the Jew in the, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, was he not? And he's telling them to do what? Well, he tells them to love their enemy. Who's their enemy? The Gentile. Does anybody, I mean, isn't this what we learn in the Old Testament? Isn't that the enemy in the Old Testament? Is there another enemy we don't know about? No, there's only one enemy. It's the Gentile. Now, Jesus is also going to pull back the curtain on the fact that there is Satan who is motivating these enemies. And they're children of, of, of this greater ultimate enemy. But nonetheless, there was real enmity that was between the Jew and the Gentile themselves in a, in a personal level in the Old Testament. Now, um, so now we have this way of peace that our, our feet are being guided into. Okay, so let's continue on because we have a little bit more to go before we bring this to a conclusion. So remember now, as we are thinking about um, you know, this idea of the way of peace. You know, the Bible talks about in Romans chapter 3, Paul writes the fact that the way of peace they have not known. He's writing about the people who are lost and on their way to hell. And he's saying in Romans 3 verse 17, the way of peace they have not known. Right? Well, the way of peace is being brought to the Jew. What we see here, according to Zacharias, the way of peace is what the light has, has risen in the darkness and is shining the way on what? Shining on the way of peace. Why? Because the Prince of Peace has come. Why? To save them from their enemies. And what else? To save them from the hand that, of those who hate them. Jesus answers their plea. He answers their cry. He gives them the answer. Now, we know that when Paul is writing this in chapter 3 of Romans, about how they're, you know, the way of peace they have not known. He's quoting from Isaiah 59, uh, which goes on and talks about that same topic. The, Isaiah 57 tells us there's no peace for the wicked, right? But there are, there is peace, peace for God's people. In fact, the Bible tells us later in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, that having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So peace is made, uh, again, with the Jews and with the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, as we're going to learn uh, here in a moment. So now let's move to the good news of peace or the gospel of peace. This is the good news that is for both Jews and Gentiles. And we're going to find this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. So let's open up our Bible hub again and let's open it up to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 11 through 22. Now, 
let's go ahead and come down. And when we look at Ephesians chapter 2, we read that he's talking about those who were made alive in Christ, those who were dead in their trespasses and sins. But let's come down to verse 11, because 11 through 22 is going to fill us with great news about the gospel of peace. This is the good news of peace. Let's read what it says. Therefore, Paul writes to the Ephesians, who, by the way, are Gentiles. Therefore, remember that formerly you, Gentile, right? The Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ. You were separate from Christ. You were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers to the covenants of promise. You had no hope, and you were without God in the cosmos. Without God. Let's run through these again. Gentile. Before Jesus. You are separate from Christ. You are excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. Gentile, you were strangers to the covenant of promise. Gentile, you had no hope. Gentile, you were without God in the world. Darkness. The Gentile had no hope. Well, we have Zeus as our God. You're without God in the world. Yeah, but we have Jupiter. No, you're without God in the world. Oh no, but we have Amun-Ra. No, you're without God in the world. Oh no, but we have the hope of Athena. No, you are without hope and without God in the world. Gentile versus Jew. We what a Gentile is? It's a non-Jew. There's two men in the Old Testament, a Jew and a Gentile, and they're fighting. They're killing each other. And that's the stories. Those are the stories that we read in the Old Testament. Oh, hurrah, David is killing Goliath. Yes, Goliath is a Gentile. Oh, hurrah, Joshua and his men are moving into Jericho and slaying everything that's it. Yeah, those are all Gentiles. Well, let's keep going here. So the, the Gentiles have no hope. The Gentiles have no hope. They, they're with, without God in the world. Without God in the world. And this is, just as a quick side note, remember, this is the era that we've been telling you about that the Founding Fathers went back to this dark age when the Gentiles were apart from God, when they had no hope, when they were strangers to the covenant of the promise. And the Founders are like, you know what we want? We want to organize our society in a way that those Gentiles who were strangers to the covenants of the promise and who had no hope and who were without God in the world and who were separate from Christ and who were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, we want to base our organizing principles based upon those Gentiles, the way they did things in the dark, without God and without hope. Let's choose their model for our government today and call it a Christian nation. It just takes a little common sense. It doesn't take too much. It just takes a little common sense to make, make you realize how absurd it is that you would want to go back to this dark time and to go to a Gentile people who were without Christ and without God in the world and draw your inspiration and governing principles from those people. It reveals a lot about what the Founding Fathers were thinking. Now, let's continue on. So we know the Gentiles are without God. They're without hope. Okay, But now, notice what it says in verse 13. Here comes the good news of peace. Here comes the good news. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, that means Gentile, far off means Gentile, but you who were formerly far off, you have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups, that is Gentile and Jew, remember two men, he has made both groups into one 
and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity. That word enmity, of course, is a very important word. It means hatred. It means uh, like you're on a collision course with someone. You know, enmity is, is, is hatred. It's, it's not a good thing. But he abolished in his flesh the enmity. What is the enmity? Which is the law of commandments contained in in ordinances. He abolished that so that in himself he made he might make the two Jew and Gentile into one new man, thus establishing peace. Now how do you make peace by bringing the two men together? Well, remember what your Old Testament tells you. Open the page in the Old Testament and find the two men fighting, the Jew and the Gentile, fighting in the Old Testament. Does anybody know this? Does anybody read their Old Testament? Well, then there you go. They're fighting in the Old Testament. So Jesus comes to do what? To make the two men into one new man, thus establishing peace. Peace between who? Peace between the Jew and the Gentile. Why? Because they've been fighting. (laughs) Because they're enemies. Because there's enmity between the two. And, let's go to verse 16, and might reconcile them into one body. We read about one body in the New Testament over and over and over and over again, always talking about this one new man that might reconcile them into one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. The the enmity between the Jew and the Gentile has been put to death. And he came, listen to verse 17. Memorize 17. And he, Jesus, came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. Jesus' message to the Gentile is peace. Jesus' message to the Jew is peace. So when Jesus is standing on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount, when he's standing there at the uh, at the Mount, and he's delivering this message to the Jews. What is he saying? He's saying, love your enemies. Let's translate that. What does that mean? He's saying, love the Gentile. He says, whenever the Gentile wants to compel you to go with him one mile, go with him two. When the Gentile wants to borrow your cloak, give him your your shirt, give him your cloak also. right? When they want you to do this or that, just do it. Love them. Go two miles instead of one. Give more than you need to give. Love them. So good news, Gentiles. Jesus is telling the Jews not to kill you anymore. If Jesus had had not told the Jews to do this, if Jesus had said, now the next step in salvation history is for you to eradicate all of the Gentiles, well, we, you and I would be in trouble, you see. It could have went a different way, huh? It could have been when Jesus comes and he's like, all right, so here's what we're going to do. Remember how you were killing you just that those people over there, you know, and uh, the Gentiles over in that area? Now we're going to kill all of them all over the world, huh? Now, now we're going to spread that violence all over the world. We're going to give you the whole world, Jews, right? Is that what Jesus did? Did Jesus come and say, all right, Jews, we're going to start killing everybody now? Right? No, he doesn't. He told the Jew to love you, Gentile. He told the Jew to love you and show compassion to you and not even hate you. The Jew is told not to even hate the Gentile by Jesus Christ. Somebody says, well, no, he's not talking to the Jews. He's talking to me whenever he's talking in the Sermon on the Mount. Well, that's confusing. He was speaking to Jews right in front of him. Now, those words are going to apply to anyone who is in Christ, of course, because those are Christ's commands to Christ's followers. But at that moment, he's speaking to Jews and telling them to love who? The Gentile. Is this different from the Old Testament? Didn't we hear go into Jericho and don't leave anything breathing, including animals? Didn't we hear that back in the Old Testament? Weren't we singing the praises of Samson as he was just slaying, you know, Philistines? Weren't we, weren't we just reading in the Old Testament that you've got to kill your enemy? 
Weren't we just reading that? Didn't we just see that in the Old Testament? Didn't we see that they were killing Gentiles in the Old Testament? Isn't that what the stories are? Is Jews killing Gentiles and Gentiles killing Jews? Isn't that the story of the Old Testament? Of course, it's the story of Jesus Christ. And that's what it's really all about. But when you look at the actual details, you see that there's a whole bunch of enmity between two men. And the good news of peace is that the Jew has been called to no longer kill you, Gentile. The Jew is not called to maim or hurt you now, Gentile. He has been called to do what? To love you. To not even hate you. That hating you violates God's commandment. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad, Gentile, that the Jew's not coming for you? Huh? Aren't you glad that the Jew is not coming for you, Gentile? It is a message of peace. But notice that Jesus, when He came and He preached, He didn't just preach peace to the, to the Jew. He didn't just look at the Jew and say, you have to love the Gentile. Remember, Jesus is coming to save them from their enemies and to save them from the hand of those who hate them. So how is He going to do this? Hmm. This is the question of the apostles. What's He going to do? Is He going to set up a kingdom and, and then destroy all of our enemies? What's He going to do? And even when Jesus is leaving, they're like, what? Aren't you going to set up this kingdom? Aren't you going to save us from our enemies? Aren't you going to save us from the hands of those who hate us? Are you just leaving now? Whenever Jesus was standing in the court of Pilate, they see two men. They see a man who's strong, Barabbas, you know, who clearly is an insurrectionist and he's a, he's a violent man who uses violence to kill the Gentiles. Sounds biblical. And then on the other side, you have this broken man who is sweating, bloody. His, his face is marred. His beard, is half of it's probably missing. They yanked it out of his head. He's got a crown of thorns on. He's got a robe. He, who is this guy going to save? Who is this guy going to save? Who, who is this guy who's standing in front, of, in front of all the people in Pilate's court? There's Barabbas, and there's Jesus Christ, who, who is called the King of the Jews. Which one's going to be the one who's going to save them from their enemies? Which one's going to be the one that's going to save them from the hand that hates them? Which one? Well, it looks like Barabbas, you know, because Barabbas is strong. And Barabbas, you know, he's mean. He's tough, boy. Well, he's probably going to go fight the enemies. And he's going to like, but then over here, you look at Jesus and say, who's going to choose this? Who thinks this man is going to save them from their enemies? Who thinks that Jesus, this, this man who's standing before them in Pilate's court, Next to Barabbas, who's a strong man and an insurrectionist and a man who takes a sword and kills the Gentile. Jesus didn't kill anybody. How is he going to save the Jews from their enemies? In fact, when you, when you read about the crucifixion, the people who are mocking, the Jews who are mocking him, are like, he can't even save himself, let alone save us. He, let him save himself, they said. He's not even going to save us. Just let him save himself. And the whole time, the whole time, Jesus was saving them from their enemies. They couldn't see it. Their eyes were blinded. They couldn't see it. He was saving them and redeeming them from the hands that hated them. But they couldn't see it. They couldn't see it. They thought Barabbas could do it because, boy, he had a sword. He might go do it. He's the one. Who, but Jesus, no, I don't see how this guy is going to do anything for us. Right? What could he possibly do? So Jesus, the people say, let him save himself. He's not going to save us. Let him save himself. He won't even do that. He won't even save himself. How do, why do we think he's going to save us? And so after all that happens, and then Rome is still in charge, in Israel, and then Jesus is getting ready to leave, the apostles are like, you've got to be kidding. Like, what? When is this kingdom going to come? Like, when are you going to save us from our enemies? And, and, peop, and some people have told us, well, he's going to do that later. You know, it's, it's going to be thousands of years later. No, that's not what Zachariah said. 
That's not what the Old Testament said. He was the Prince of Peace, and He came to redeem us from what? He, he came to save us. He came to save the Jews from what? Their enemies. He came to save the Jews from what? The hand that hated them. Did He? Yes, He did. Yes, He did. How? By making the two men that were fighting one man. One man. One brand new man. We read in the book of Acts chapter 10, Peter, after being filled with the Holy Spirit and then also seeing a vision, he opens his mouth in Acts chapter 10 and Peter says, most certainly I understand now, now, that God is not one to show partiality. Took a little bit to get it through. Took a little bit to get it through. To people as though Gentiles were excluded from God's blessing, you know the message which he sent to the sons of Israel, that is the Jew, announcing the good news of peace, the gospel of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. So Jesus came and he preached peace to the Jew. He also, the Bible tells us, preaches peace to the Gentile. How does he do that? He, do, he does that through Paul, through Peter, Right? And when you read through the apostles' writings, they're always telling you to do what? Kill the Gentile? No. Kill the Jew? No. No, no killing. No killing whatsoever. I know the American church is fine with killing. I know that they celebrate killing. I know they're happy to lay down other people's lives. Uh, you know, and they, they love the, the soldiers who participate in the war. But there is no more war. Somebody says, well, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. Yeah, there's wars for the world. The world has... Jesus, I'm not giving you the peace the world gives. The, the world gives a peace that's interrupted by war. I'm not giving you that. I'm giving you my peace. My peace transcends. It passes all understanding. I'm giving you that. And now, your enemies have been dealt with. Now, the hand that hates you has been dealt with. I've saved you from it. And you say, well, how? How did he save us from the enemy? They're still here. Jesus says, love your enemy. Jesus says, do good to those who hate you. There's the salvation. That's what salvation is. Salvation is not you signing a card, joining a church and saying, I'm part of a club. No, that has nothing to do with salvation. Salvation is salvation from your enemies and from the hand of those who hate you. That is what Jesus came to bring. When you have that, then there's peace with God. But it has to be fixed on earth. If you have a problem with your brother... Go fix it first before you go give your gift to God. God doesn't want to hear your prayer until you've solved it with your brother. Go work it out with your brother, then come back to God. Jesus is laying it out how it works. Fix it on earth, and it's fixed in heaven. And you can't fix it on earth, so I'm going to be your peace. I'm going to be the one who does it. And I'm going to model it for you. I'm going to break the back of the Roman Empire. Through love. I'm going to destroy the works of the enemy through peace, love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Break it! He broke the back of the Roman Empire. How? Love, joy, peace. Didn't raise a sword. Didn't raise a sword. Didn't kill a soul. Loved his enemies. Prayed for those who persecuted him. Forgave those who were killing him. Looking down at the one who was nailing him to the cross and saying, Lord, forgive that person. Forgive him. He doesn't know. He doesn't know there's no more war. He doesn't know. He's being lied to. 
The Prince of Peace is here. His horn has been raised up. That government is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The increase of that horn will never end. The increase of the peace of that government will never end. His government is here. His government is peace. And He is the Prince of Peace. And when we walk in hatred, and when we walk in war, we walk outside the promises. When we walk in war, when we walk in strife, when we walk in all of those things, we are walking outside the promises of God. Somebody says, well, I need my gun in case somebody tries to kill me. You don't have any enemies. Well, but no, but I do. Somebody hates me. No. You, you, uh, the only way to get this message, and because remember, the, the apostles were beating their heads against the wall saying, I don't understand. And then finally, Paul's, or Peter's like, oh, now I understand. <laughs> after this vision and after the Holy Spirit and after all, he's like, now I get it. Now I understand. There's no partiality. The Prince of Peace has come. The two have been made one. So the only killing going on in the Old Testament for the most part that was hostile was Jews killing Gentiles. Jesus comes and says, time out. Love the Gentile. Gentile, love the Jew. There's the salvation. Salvation is in the love. The salvation is in the joy. The salvation is in the peace. The salvation is in the patience. The salvation is in the long-suffering. The salvation is in the gentleness. The salvation is in the meekness, and we can't see it. We want to find it in the sword somewhere. Surely he's surely a sword is needed to enact, and the sword is needed. It's called the Word of God. Now, where does this government live? Where is this government? You say, well, this horn of salvation has been raised up. Well, where's the government? The government is in your mind, and the government is in your heart. Let's read about that. Romans chapter 12. This is Paul. Remember, Paul goes into the wilderness for 14 years in, this, in Arabia, for 14 years with the Holy Spirit. That same Holy Spirit that prompted Zacharias to prophesy. That same Holy Spirit that prompted Daniel to prophesy. That same Holy Spirit that prompted the Apostle John to prophesy. That same Holy Spirit that anointed Jesus. That same Holy Spirit is with Paul. And Paul's in the wilderness for 14 years with the Holy Spirit. He comes out like a blaze of fire and begins to write all of these epistles. And here's what he tells the Romans, who are Gentiles. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world but let God transform you into a new man. Here it is, the new person, the new man. Let Him transform you into a new man by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So you have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind in order to understand the salvation. The renewing of the mind is what's required. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. What? The peace of God guards your hearts and guards your minds. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, Colossians 3, to which you were also called in one body, the one new man, and be thankful. The peace of God you, if you are a believer in Christ, Christ has saved you from your enemies. If you are a believer in Christ, God has saved you from every hand that hates you. Now you might think to yourself, no, I have people who hate me. Oh no, that's not true because I know I have an enemy. Hear, hear the word of the Lord in all of this. He has saved you from that. Fear not. Have peace that never is disrupted by any kind of strife or war. When people look at the early church, they're always dumbfounded by the fact that the church was so docile. That's because they understood this message. They understood that God was the God of God was a God of vengeance, and He was going to be the one who was going to deliver their vengeance. 
and that the heat that God had saved them. So in the middle of being occupied by Rome, these Christians are like, wow, we are one new man. God is making one new man and he's delivered us from our enemies. But we are like, wait, but they're cutting their heads off. They're, 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 they're bringing them in and making them profess Caesar is Lord. And if not, they're killing them. The Christians are like, they're not our enemy. If they were, if that was their enemy, they would have been picking up swords to fight Caesar. Say, well, we've got to stop this. They're trying to take away our rights. They they want to make us do things that we don't want to do, and and we're not going to allow that. We need more rights. You know, how come the early church didn't have the revelation of the 18th century founding fathers who wanted to go back to the organizing principles of ancient Rome and Greece, which were without God and apart from the promises and the covenants? Why is it that the early church didn't have the epiphany? of the founding fathers, that all they had to do was pick up a gun and make things right. How come? How come they didn't know that? How come they didn't have that revelation? Why was that revelation reserved for the founding fathers, most of whom didn't believe in the Jesus Christ that you and I talk about? It's because the early church understood rightly that they had been redeemed from their enemies and they had been redeemed from every hand that hated them. Therefore, if anyone had a problem with them, that was their problem because they didn't have any enemies. The Christians didn't have any enemies. This is what we even read about. You read in the first three centuries, you'll see that the, the Romans were like, these, these people are crazy. Like they, They're like, just go die. And, and plus, in fact, they were even considered gullible and, and vulnerable because they would they would do nice things for people even when those people were trying to do bad things to them because they didn't view themselves as having enemies. We think we have enemies. Many American Christians are here like, yeah, we have enemies. The enemies are those, that poor Guatemalan woman who's coming across the border trying to get rights in America. See, American Christians have lots of enemies. They have liberals that are enemies to them, or if they're on the other side, it's conservatives that are, that are enemies to them. Uh, Russians are enemies to them. Uh, Chinese are enemies to them, right? They got a lot of enemies. American church got a lot of enemies, right? And they're willing to go kill and die. Uh, they're willing to go kill at least uh, to go fight those enemies, even though their own Bible tells them that they don't have any more enemies. And even if they do have someone who's claiming to be their enemy, he's supposed to love that person. So if you love your neighbor and you love your enemy, what's left? There's nothing. It's love. You're at peace with your enemies. Your enemies may not be at peace with you, but that's their problem. That's because they're not saved. You're at peace with your enemies. Whatever they do to you, they can't... Don't fear those who can kill the body but can't kill the soul, Jesus says over and over and over and over, as does Paul. To live as Christ and die as gain. We're not trying to protect our bodies, and that's what salvation means. Many, It would seem that many Christians today would say, well, salvation means that I have to protect my body. If, if my body dies, then, then I'm, I'm not saved. What? No, it has nothing to do with anything. Jesus said, don't try to worry about your body. They're gonna, they may kill your body. You're going to look like me if they kill your body. You're going to look like the apostle uh, you know, Peter if, you, if they kill your body. You're going to look like the apostle Paul if they kill, kill your body. What are you worried about that for? That actually, that actually looks like something that's good. But instead... Many Christians are like, well, I got to kill before they kill me. Now, that's, thankfully, that was not the attitude of the first three centuries of Christianity. Fortunately, they were not trying to kill others before they were killed. Otherwise, we would have pretty horrific testimonies from the first three centuries. And we don't. We have the opposite. Christians who were just dying, refusing to go to war with those who were killing them because they didn't have an enemy. They loved. If you love your enemies, who's your enemy? I mean, isn't that really all you can withhold from an enemy is love? And if you give love to the enemy, then you almost deprive that person of being an enemy. Therefore, that's the whole point. Your mind has to be renewed. Our minds have to be renewed. We have a lot of comments. I'm going to put some of these comments up here so we can see them. Uh, let's start here with, uh, Roger. Roger says the mind is the highest part of the soul. We must, uh, let me see here. Yes. Uh, we must acquire the mind of Christ to be fully converted and make our joy full and glorify God. Amen, Roger. Absolutely. Absolutely. The high, the mind is the highest part of the soul. 
we have to have the mind of Christ. We have to put on the mind of Christ. How many people did Christ kill in self-defense? Here's, here's Mark Grubbs. Mark says, in no way does the message of peace brought by Christ mean that self-defense for the individual or the state is sinful. Well, Mark, let's just, let's just, you, you tell me whenever uh, Christ used self-defense. You tell me when, and I'll follow him in that. You tell me whenever the Apostle John used self-defense, and we'll copy John. You tell me when Paul, who are you referring to? Who are you referring to that used self-defense to kill before they were killed? Who? Name me somebody in the first three centuries you're talking about, and then we'll have a discussion. Let's see. We have Dr. U.S. says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Amen. Thank you for providing scripture instead of just making up stories. Let's see here. Uh, peace, Chiswick. Peace in the world require, requires mass sinful man's blood. Peace in the kingdom of God requires one sinless man's blood. Amen. That's a good, that's a good word. Uh, this is, uh, I believe this is Becky. Oh, it's Becky. Hey, Becky. Great to see you. Jerry, this has been an, a most excellent hour of listening. I must step away now, but we'll return later today to listen to the end, Becky. Thank you for being here, Becky. I really appreciate it. Thank you for those kind words, too. Uh, Dr. U.S. adds, perhaps this is the separation of those who had eyes to see and not those who didn't have eyes to see, those who would receive him and those who would not, referring to the blindness, perhaps. Thank you for that. That's a very good, very good comment. Um, now, let's see. Let's go ahead and... Um, go to a couple more here. Let's see. Chiswick says, so Jesus brought us peace with God and peace with man. The fighting, the wars, the enmity abolished in his flesh. The Old Testament wars are brought to an end with Jesus. That's true. In other words, let's put it to, let's put it to you this way, that if, if, if Christians today want to extend the Old Testament laws on violence, Basically, they're, they're asking for Jews to kill Gentiles. David says, God makes my hands to war. Against who? Against the Jew? No, against the Gentile. Against the Gentile. So if, if you like the Old Testament violent verses, then you should still be with Jews going out and killing Gentiles. Is that what you want to have happen? Because that's what it's talking about. It's talking about Jews going out and killing Gentiles, going into their cities and killing them. Okay. So as a Christian, are you pro that? W would you be like, well, the Jews need to keep the Old Testament and go and, and, and spread bloodshed into other, other areas? And suddenly you'll find out something. So you'll find out something really interesting. You'll find out that Gentiles suddenly don't want Jews going out and keeping that law, but the Gentile wants to keep them. So the Jew is not allowed to keep his law. He can't go out and conduct wars and go fight against the Gentiles because I'm a Gentile. But the Gentiles... In Christians today can use those Old Testament uh, killing laws to, to use today. The Jews can't use them, but the, but the Christians can. That's, that's what we're talking about. That's, that's completely absurd. The Old Testament is filled up with stories about Jews killing Gentiles. You want to, perpet you want to perpetuate that? You want to keep that going? You want that to continue in the Christian church? You want the Christian church to continue promoting that? You want to use uh, Samson killing the Philistines to, to justify the United States dropping nuclear bombs on, on some country or dropping you know, bombs on, on Iraq or Afghanistan? Is that the same thing? I think it's funny, by the way, that many Christians today would happily go and kill in war for their president, but they won't take a vaccine for their president. What does that tell you? What does it tell you? That the president's like, hey, would you please have a vaccine to protect people? And people are like, oh, no, we can't do that. We have rights. But then whenever the president's like, hey, I, I need you guys to uh, come and help us go kill these Iraqi people, they're like, absolutely. And the church stands up and they're so ready to go kill the Iraqi uh, for the president because the president asked, you know. Hey, the president just needs us to go kill a few people, right? And hey, we're Christians. What does it matter? We'll go kill a few people. The president asked. The president said. The president wants us to do it. 
The president wants us to go kill some Iraqis, so let's just hop on a plane and go join them. Hey, let's send our daughter. Let's send our son. Let's go ourselves. Too bad we don't have two lives to go kill Iraqis with. Huh? But now the president asks for you to get a vaccine. Oh, no, no, I have rights. Oh, no. Well, he's trying to get me to do a vaccine. Oh, no. But the president wants you to go kill an Iraqi. Oh, that's fine. Shh, shh, ready to go. Let's go. We got to do what the president says. Got to obey the law. It's interesting what we choose to obey and what we choose not to. It kind of reveals something, doesn't it? it kind of reveals something about ourselves. We're happy to kill. We just don't want the vaccine. Now, this isn't about vaccines. I could care less. My, my point is, is that you see what I'm talking about. How many Christians have drawn a line in the sand over vaccines, but they willingly go, will go drop a nuclear bomb on some other country and think it's fine because the president said. Yeah. How do you deal with that? So still no reply from Mark Grubbs, who had boldly, uh, boldly come in and said that in no way was the message of peace, meaning that we couldn't kill people. But when I challenged him for another reply, we've still yet to get anything. So I guess he doesn't have any verses, which is what I was afraid of. Mark, if you have a... Um, well, it gave you a pretty, pretty good long while here. If you have any example that you would show of those who use self-defense to kill in the New Testament, I'd love to see them. We'd all love to see them. Just go ahead and type it in for us. Are you referring to Jesus who didn't kill anybody? Or are you referring to Paul who didn't kill anybody? Or are you referring to Peter who didn't kill anybody? Or John who didn't kill anybody? Or Matthew who didn't kill anybody? Or are you referring to one of the early church fathers who didn't kill anybody? Who are you referring to? How do you know that the message of peace doesn't mean we're allowed, that means we're allowed to kill people? Where do you get that? Jesus is the Prince of Peace. We follow the way of peace. And by definition, war is the opposite of peace. Strife is the opposite of peace. So no, we don't have to kill anybody. We don't have any enemies. Who would we kill? Who would we kill? We have to love all of our enemies. Who would we kill, Mark? Come on, give me something. Don't leave us all hanging here. Now, the Bible does say we have an ultimate enemy. And the Bible does say that we have to love our enemy. So it implies that there are people who don't like us. But with the renewing of our minds, we don't view them that way. We, we don't, if we have enemies, we're going to arm up. We're going to think we have to protect ourselves. But if we renew our minds and realize that God has dealt with our enemies, then we have no one to kill anymore. So if you do come up with, a, with something, we'd love to hear it. Uh, let's see. Apparently not. Chiswick, Jesus never taught his followers to overthrow Rome. Paul never taught his flocks to overthrow Nero, one of the worst tyrants in human history, um, especially towards Christians. Uh, let me see. Uh, as followers of Christ, we are to be about the gospel of peace, not worldly peace, which is impossible, by the way, that because Jesus told us there would be wars. So very good. Lots of comments here uh, that have come in. Um... Let's see, we do have another comment, a very good comment. Well, this one here also, uh, Dr. U.S. Wow, this explains why the Jews have, who follow Jesus aren't still fighting to take the promised land in the New Testament. The Old Testament is full of wars against the Gentiles. That's right. Now, I want to make a quick comment um, about the one new man. We were talking about one new man a while ago. And... When it talks about the one new man, I want you to know that it's not talking about the one new, it's not talking about one new Jew. This is where we get a lot of bad teachings. The one new man can, can, uh, can confuse sometimes. Remember that when Jesus came, that he wasn't, God wasn't trying to make one new Jew out of the, the people. And he wasn't trying to make one new Gentile out of the people. Instead, he, was, he, had, he had, uh, was making one new man out of the two. So he took a Jew and a Gentile, and he made them one new man. Right? So it's both of them. 
Now, if you get in the Hebrew root side where people are saying you have to be Jewish and you have to keep all the laws and all of this, you know who these people are. And if you are, if you're part of that, or if you're, you're if you've been kind of tangled up in some sort of Hebrew root stuff, understanding there's nothing wrong with learning about Hebrew roots. There's nothing wrong with knowing and even keeping the, the biblical feasts if you want to. I mean, if you just simply want to because you're free. But remember that God did not come to make one new Jew. He's, he doesn't want to make you a, a one new Jew. He was making one new man. This is a third type of person. This is not a Jew, and this is not a Gentile. This is one new man out of the two. Now, I, uh, just like you can err and go and say, well, God wants to make one new Jew, and everybody needs to live like the Jews did. Well, that's, that's one way you can take this teaching and go wrong. Because one new man is made out of the two. On the other hand, you can go the other side and say, well, God wanted to make one new Gentile, and all the Jews have lost all of their grace, and now they all need to act like Gentiles and be Gentiles. Well, that's not what it's saying either. Uh, and that's where you get replacement theology and supersessionism and all of this. So we're not called to be one new Gentile. He's not calling us to be one new Jew. He's calling us to be one new man, bringing the two together, and there's peace between the two. And if you read the Jerusalem Council of Acts chapter 15, you'll see the freedom that the Gentiles have in being this one new man. They're not called to go back and keep all the Mosaic Code, which was the enmity between the Jew and the Gentile. They're called to follow Jesus. And the Jerusalem Council makes it very clear. And then, of course, Peter later on has this vision, or earlier on has the vision about the fact that all people are acceptable to God. You have to realize how radical this is, because up until this time in the Old Testament, the Gentile was the enemy. And technically, he was the enemy. He, he was apart from God. He was apart from Christ. He was outside the promises. He was without God. He was without hope. So the fact that God brings in the Gentile is good news. And the fact that the Jew is not told to kill the Gentile anymore is good news. And the fact that the Gentile is told not to kill the Jew anymore is good news. So if we're Christians and we're like, but we can still kill Christians. We can still kill people, right? No, no, you just missed the whole point of salvation there. You just missed the whole point of salvation. He came and he made one new man out of these two men who were killing each other. He brought peace and made one new man. So he doesn't want you to kill other Christians. He doesn't want you to kill any Gentiles, and He doesn't want you to kill any Jews. He wants you to walk in the way of peace, following the Prince of Peace, preaching the Gospel of Peace. That's what He wants from you. If you think that He wants you to kill, if you think that He wants you to maim someone, if you think that He wants you to devastate your enemies through war, you are not understanding salvation. It's just, simply that, it's just simply that straightforward. Salvation is peace with all men. Great comment. Thank you. Roger, Paul teaches Adam was the first man. Jesus was the second man. We as believers are the third new man. Love it. Love it. Thank you, Roger. Very, very powerful. With Jesus as the head. Let's not forget, with Jesus as the head of that man. Amen, brother. Good word. Okay, so we've gone through a whole lot today, uh, and uh, we've, we've covered a lot. We talked about peace. So I want to encourage you to go in peace and to think about this in peace. Remember, the, one of the phrases that we see over and over in the New Testament is Jesus saying, go in peace, go in peace. So in other words, this is a very biblical phrase. So you go in peace, following the Prince of Peace, walking in the way of peace, and preach the gospel of peace. Join us in preaching the gospel of peace to all men, goodwill towards all men, Jew and Gentile, no more war, no more fighting, no more strife, no more hatred. Jesus calls the Jew to love the Gentile. He calls the Gentile to love the Jew. Time out on the killing, it's over. The warrior's boot will be cast into the fire, for a son has been born to us, a child has been given to us. 
So we have no one to kill. We have no one to fight. We only have peace in our hearts. We have no enemies. If someone wants to be our enemy, that's their problem. That means they're probably not saved or they're dangerously flirting with hellfire. We don't have any enemies. So we go in peace, serving the Prince of Peace, walking in the way of peace, and teaching the gospel of peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. God, it's a hard word. Father, help me to continue to say the things that need to be said without fear or reprisal, without fearing man. Let each one of us, Lord, not fear men to the point where we have to arm ourselves and, and fight as if we have enemies, as if, as if God is not, has not already vanquished our enemies, as if God is not already our avenger, as if God will not deal with our enemies. Lord, help us to remember that you will deal with our, all of those who hate us, all of those who despise us. You've saved us. They can't do anything to us. They kill our body, but that's, that's all they can do. They can't kill our soul. Help us not to be afraid of those who can kill the body, but not kill the soul. And Father, more importantly, help us to fear you who can kill both the body and soul and send it into hellfire. God, help us fear you more than we fear man. Help us to fear you more than we fear man. And then we will walk in peace towards all. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends. What a great day today, huh? This has been a good day. Uh, someone saying, best Christmas message I've ever heard. Praise God. Praise God. What a great day. So this is our final teaching, uh, final rethink teaching for uh, 2022. We'll be back in January with another teaching, another hard-hitting teaching. We're not slowing down, and we're not going to get any easier it's going to continue to intensify. We have a lot more things to talk about. If you have any questions we couldn't address on today's uh, teaching, feel free to send those to us. You can send them to us at uh, True Riches Radio. You can just go to truerichesradio.com and click on the contact button and send us a, uh, a note there. We have lots of articles, lots of videos available for you that you can watch at your leisure, lots of uh, 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 podcast episodes as well, and videos and articles. So feel free to check those out, truerichesradio.com. Feel free to share our, te our teachings with other people. Uh, we're getting uh, quite a bit of people who are sharing our teachings, and it's helping us spread our reach. We want to spread our reach. We, wanna, we want more people to hear this. We want more people to be uh, comforted by the message of peace, by the gospel of peace. And uh, you can help us by sharing these teachings on social media with your friends, uh, those who need encouragement. A lot of people are confused about the church today. They're confused about the message and the conflicting messages. They're confused as to why the world seems to be worshiping political sa saviors while ignoring the heavenly savior. They don't understand. You can help them by pointing them in the direction of the, of the word of God and biblical teachings. And I believe that these uh, teachings are uh, uh, biblical, and we'll help those who you share them with. God bless you, everybody, and we'll see you in January. God bless.